All right, welcome back to another episode of the Install with Greg Cosell of NFL Films. No more vacation. I don't know that Greg took any anyway, but everybody's back. Training camps are open. People are tweeting completion percentages and how many field goal kicks the kicker made at a training camp. Greg, we're back, baby. It feels great. You know, if a good quarterback throws an incompletion, I think he's probably going to be benched based on the first day of practice. What do you think? I, I think that's exactly the way that I read it across every camp on the internet. I know. Today, every last one. But well, people, way, hey, it's good for us, uh, Buck. People are starved for football. Hey, it's what we do, you know. That's it's, exactly it's what I've done right for a long right. time. It's exciting that it's it's back. Um, you know, so uh, I've been grinding away. I've kind of switched a bit from watching college tape now to – to watching different, you know, NFL things just to kind of get back in the groove. Which is exactly what we're going to do today. So with uh, with Greg's focus on different situations and different players that he's watching, Greg, you spent a lot of time watching the Titans' third down passing game. I did. Specifically. I did. Uh, you know, because it was something that had been clearly talked about. And just so people understand, during the season, because of what I do, specifically with my NFL matchup show, I have to watch as many games and as many teams as I can. And while that gives me a very good feel for teams, in the off season when I can sit and watch, you know, 250 plays consecutively of one team, whether it be offense or defense, sometimes that gives you a different worldview. And uh, so I, I did that with the Titans third down offense. And boy, I found some things that I I kind of remembered noticing during the season, but they didn't hit me with the same impact, Buck, when I was watching, you know, 250 plays in a row. Which is exactly the kind of analysis I think people are just looking to, you know, know where they need to grow and where these things are, what what kind of things are starting to pop up in certain situations. And obviously third down passing game, it's a critical part of the offense, especially for as many third, third and six plus passing situations yeah. as the Titans were put in based on their yeah. limitations. They were put in a lot last year, by the way. That's one thing that stood out just as a matter of down and distance. Far too many third and longs. Um, but what I, I will say this, um, what really stood out to me, and, and I guess I was somewhat surprised. I didn't remember it this strongly was their strong tendency to use both the back and the tight end to chip or even to stay in to pass protect. And what that does is even when they chip that removes them as primary receivers. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you're sending out your three wide receivers, if it's 11 personnel, which of course it always is on third and long for the most part, high percentage of the time. So you're sending out your three wide receivers as primary receivers, because when a back and tight end chip, they don't get into routes as quickly, and that limits the kind of routes they can run. Right. And I tell you what was even more surprising about that to me was how often they use the tight end to chip on Taylor Lewan's side. I was really kind of struck by that. Did, I mean, Taylor Lewan theoretically is one of the top left tackles in the NFL. I would think that Tennessee views him that way. And it, it, that kind of said to me, did they lack confidence in his one-on-one -on -one pass protection ability? Because they did that a very good percentage of the time. And as I said, not only the Lawan factor, but when you only send out three wide receivers on third and long, the defense has an advantage right away, particularly if they only rush four, because now they have seven in coverage to play three wide receivers who are your primary route runners. Yeah, th that's among the biggest questions is the offensive line specifically, because Taylor's situation, Greg, we've talked about him before whatever tier of of player you consider him in he's not one of these overwhelming like outright stud left tackles Taylor Lewan has bad snaps but no I've never seen it quite as shaky as it was last year with him coming off the ACL yeah and really him really taking a considerable amount of time to get comfortable with his own body again it felt like yeah and that's very fair I mean again we don't know how guys feel, sure. but ultimately you still have to play. I mean, one thing I learned from being with former players, you know, I've been doing the NFL matchup show since 1984. I've worked with a lot of former players and these guys know what they're in for. If you're on the field, the injury is irrelevant. You yeah. know, I mean, you're playing. I mean, that's just the reality of the NFL. And um, sure, some guys play when they're hurt. Maybe they shouldn't be playing, but you know how that goes. These guys are all warriors to a certain extent. They want to be out there. And once you're out there, 
there's no excuses. We're not singing Kumbaya. There's no excuses. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that really stood out because of the use of the tight end as either a primary blocker, pass protector, or as a chipper is that the tight end was really not a meaningful factor in their third down pass game. No. And, you know, it was easy for people to say, oh, what happened to Anthony Ferks? Or, or, you know, we know Jeff Swaim isn't really a receiver. He's used more as a blocker. But, um, you know, Ferks, who I, I actually believed had legitimate talent as a tight end and maybe in a different circumstance could actually be a factor as a receiver. But the way they played using the tight end to chip so often – the tight end was really not a factor in their third down pass game. So that raises the question, and no one knows the answer to this, because obviously they've got Tim Kelly now along with Todd Downing. So we don't know how that's going to play out. We don't know if there'll be changes because Tim Kelly has new ideas. We don't know any of that right now. It's so early in the process. But obviously they brought in Austin Hooper, and you'd like to believe he was not brought in to chip and, and pass protect on third down. No, because they still have Jeff Swain to do that. They have Hooper and Chigakonkwo to be able to get, I think, a little more versatile with their tight end usage because I think the players they were working with, Greg, and, and out of necessity last year, everybody dealt with the, the COVID salary cap yeah. cut and you had to skimp in certain places. For tight, I don't think it was any more apparent than the Titans' tight end position anywhere else on that roster last year. So their their hope is that it allows them to get back more fundamentally to what they want to do and include the tight end more specifically in the third down passing game. Yeah, and they started to do that a little bit more later in the season in 2021, but not quite enough where it really mattered. Um, another thing that really stood out to me, Buck, was um, their third and, and sixth plus pass game in particular was predominantly based on half field reads, especially out of what we call one by three sets, meaning that you had three receivers to one side. We call that trips. Mm -hmm. And the tight end was the single receiver to the short side of the field. And very often they just ran even though there were three receivers to that side, very often they were really just two-man route concepts to the trip side. And what that tells you when you watch tape is they were defining where they wanted Tannehill to throw the ball. They were they were rarely, rarely full field progression reads. They wanted to say, hey, Brian, here's where we want you to throw the football. Um, so, you know, again, I'm just telling you what the film shows sure. because that's what it shows. This is not this is not an opinion or an interpretation. That's what the film shows. If people want to then take from that and think that, oh, well, that says something negative about Tannehill, people can decide that on their own. And obviously, I'm sure in their quiet moments at 11 o'clock at night, you know, uh, after a day of practice, the coaching staff, when they're, you know, sitting around having their drinks and shooting the you know what, they're probably having serious conversations that they would not share with you, me, or any media members. So we don't know what those conversations are. I've been fortunate enough in my career to be sitting at, in training camps where I've I've heard those conversations, so I know that they get very open and honest in those conversations. But I'm only telling you what the film shows, that they really kept it to half field reads for Tannehill. And they did a lot with trips where there were three receivers to the trip side, three wide so, receivers. So I because I, I think it, if I'm if I'm visualizing this correctly, Greg, with what you've just described, is that a the, the same kind of alignment that they came out with in the first play of the game against the Cincinnati Bengals where he threw the interception there wasn't a route on the backside it was a two it was a two or three wide receiver uh concept to his right and they had no route on the backside to kind of draw the safety away from where the um, ball ended up going because that that's at least what I'm picturing in my head as an example of Tannehill maybe not of things trying to be simplified for Tannehill so that was, being a that little was, bit predictable. You're talking about the playoff game, right? Talking about the playoff game. So was that – I'm going to just look at my notes because I can't remember the play. Sure. The no, sixth, it's not fair. I just I – just No, 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 that's play. fine, but I'll be able to find it pretty quick. So that was – was that the wild card game? That was the – no, it would have been the divisional round because they were the one seed. So it would have been – okay, so week uh, 18. It would have been week 20 then. Correct. That would have been okay. week 20 – with the Titans uh, and the Bengals here. I don't in believe that that was the case, but I'm going to just pull up my notes right away. So it's Titans offense, Bengals defense. Yeah. So no, no, totally different because I, they open here. I, I have it right in front of me. Here's what okay. I typed. Here's what I typed about the play. Titans opened the game in 12 personnel. 
meaning one back, two tight ends. They opened in a formation that's very common in the league out of 12 personnel, meaning both tight ends were to the short side of the field, tight to the formation, what we call a closed boundary. And then they had twins to the field. OK, the Bengals match that with a six man front out of their base defense. Makes sense. They were in base because there are two tight ends on the field. OK, Bates was the post safety in a three under three deep coverage. It was a zone concept. The Titans did run a two man route to the field right. of conventional play action. So to the field, meaning to the twin side where there were two wide receivers. Um that particular play, Tannehill off the play fake had only one place to look to throw, and that took Bates to the throw for the interception. So okay. Jones was the intended receiver, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was different than what we're talking about on third and six plus or third and long, because you're rarely playing 12 personnel close boundary twins to the field in a, you know, on, on third and six plus. But again, it was that play was designed. That was probably more of a one read play. And Bates, who's a very smart safety, I think he just read it right from the get go. I think he knew what the play was. No, NFL films. When I say had... knew what the play was. I don't mean he knew what the play was based on, you know, Wednesday's practice. Right. I mean, once he saw the 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 formation and once he saw the initial run action, I think he said, hey, that's where the ball's going. It was either Showtime or inside the NFL. Somebody had him mic'd up for sound, and that was exactly the quote. Like, he knew exactly where the ball was going. He identified it right away yeah. as soon as he saw it. Because I don't want people to think, well, like, you know, they knew the play call and they knew they were in the huddle, right. you know, because people like to think that kind of stuff. But, no, I think, you know, players are pretty smart. The other team gets paid, too. And, and Bates is a really smart, aware, savvy safety in some ways like Kevin Byard is. And I think once he saw the formation, seeing the formation probably told him right away, hey, there's two or three things that happen out of this formation. And then as soon as he saw Tannehill turn his back um, with the play action, he probably knew uh, in his mind exactly where the ball was going. Yeah. Just, just to kind of bring the conversation back. So the third and six plus situations that they were in so often, we know their limitations last year. We know yep. that they ran the ball on first down more than any other team in the sport and on second and seven plus more than any other team in the sport. They did not have the kind of success that they would ideally like to, I'm sure, on early downs. And it yeah. puts them in these positions. Now, yeah. you know, health is the obvious answer to how can they avoid or how can they how can they perform at a higher level to where that's not their efficiency is not such on early downs where they're putting themselves yeah. in those positions. But schematically, Greg, is are there things or formationally, are there things that they can do to give them more success? on early sure. downs because empty sets is the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. And Tim Kelly has a Bill O'Brien background and Bill O'Brien is a big believer in empty sets, but empty sets require a couple of things. Number one, you don't want to get stuck in empty sets where every throw has to be quick game because defenses will recognize that after a while and they'll sit on short throws. So ultimately empty sets have to involve your offensive line. You have to be able to pass protect with five because you'd like to be able to send five out as all primary route runners. Now they're all not running vertical deep routes, obviously, but you don't want to get stuck with always having to chip or to use um, the, the closest receiver to the formation as a pass protector. So you want to be able to send out five. So you do have to pass protect. That's critical. Uh, that's the starting point. The other thing is your quarterback has to be really good uh, and, and have great awareness as to where potential blitz pressures could come from because obviously it's the old Rex Ryan philosophy. Rex Ryan always believed that if you were an empty, he could hit your quarterback yeah. because you, you're blocking with five for the most part. You can always get someone clean to the quarterback if you're only blocking with five. So your quarterback has to be aware of where those threats are are now people like empty because it forces the defense to declare earlier they need to spread out they can't put seven people on the line of scrimmage because then they can't cover people so so a lot of people like empty because it spreads the defense out and it forces them to show their hand before the snap of the ball but you can still get a free blitzer so the quarterback has to be aware of who that might be 
Um, so that puts a burden pre-snap on your quarterback. He has to be aware. I mean, I've seen quarterbacks get drilled because they just weren't aware that there was a rusher in empty. And 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 I'm not talking about D linemen because they're being blocked, obviously. I'm talking about a blitzer. So your quarterback has to be aware of that. Tannehill has a ton of experience. You would think that's something he would be able to handle without much of an issue. Yeah, and I think I think that's a fair assessment and it should be the expectation of him. But I, I guess, yeah. Greg, what, what we watched with him last year was just kind of cracks in the foundation once stuff started to erode around him, understandably so. Um, is that is that something that specifically in that area, that kind of recognition that you're talking about, did, did you see him suffer at all last year? from not being able to kind of identify things. No, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. I mean, you know, and again, I can't remember specifically every play, sure. but and I don't I want to ask say, you a general yeah. question unfairly. Yeah, that's that's a hard question for me to answer. So I don't want to give a, a, a specific answer one way sure. or the other. I, I could well be wrong and I don't want to be wrong. Um sure. but you know I think that you know I think that Tannehill over the years you know, he's a good throw of the football. He's a big kid. He's got a good arm. You know, don't forget there was a couple of years there where they were scoring a lot of points. Tannehill was throwing the ball well, big years. When you're in too many third and longs, and that was the case last year, that really puts a strain on everybody on your offense. And obviously it comes back on the quarterback because third and long, the defense has the tactical advantage. So it's just harder. I mean, that's why they talk about third down being the money down. But you know, you don't want to be in a lot of third and longs, and that's not a profound statement. But to me, the bigger issue with this offense is not just the third and longs. Obviously, that was an issue a year ago. But to be proactive, trying to orchestrate and manufacture explosive plays. See, the, the one advantage they have when Derrick Henry is healthy is he can at least provide explosive plays as a runner. Now, there, there's not many running backs in the league, quite honestly, that can do that. Now, that does give them an advantage. But if you're going to run the ball with the volume that they do and and you're not really creating explosive plays in the run game, at some point, you've got to create explosive plays. There have been many, many studies done, Buck, that show that explosive plays, however you want to define them, 15 plus, 20 plus, different people define them different ways, that there's a strong correlation between explosive plays and winning football. It's really hard in this league to go 12, 13 plays and score touchdowns on a consistent basis. So you need to create explosive plays and percentage wise, they come out of the pass game and you don't want to get stuck trying to do that on third and nine. You want to be proactive in orchestrating explosive pass play concepts. Yeah, it, it felt like they were that they were on the verge <clears throat> of moments where they had explosive plays down the field, Greg, and they're coming back to the offensive line issues last year, not just. Taylor Lewan and and confidence and and needing to keep running backs and tight ends into chip, but just generally blown block assignments is something that they seem to suffer from yeah. throughout the course of the season. Because I can specifically remember a touchdown that would have been Julio Jones first against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I remember that. It I could have that easily play, yeah. been a bomb, but there was a miscommunication between Aaron Brewer and Dontrell Hilliard, who I believe was the running back. And instead of a 70-yard yeah. touchdown, it's a nine-yard loss. And and I believe that was the first play of the game, was it not? It was exactly. Yeah, that. yeah. And 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 that's the thing. That, that's when coaches up in the booth I'll get very creative with their cursing because they had it set up beautifully, and it's and it becomes a mental breakdown. Oh, we you know, we oh. were we were kind of looking at him like, oh man, I feel for him because he had it. It was there. I saw exactly what. We oh saw no, I remember the play now. I th I believe it was down the left sideline, if I'm not mistaken. That's that's 100 yeah. percent right. Yeah. And and, you know, whether it's a physical breakdown, whether a guy just misses his block or whether it's a mental breakdown, it doesn't matter. The point is, you know, teams try to create explosive plays proactively, because like I said, sure, do great teams convert third downs? Sure, they do. I mean, that's one reason they're really good, sure. you know, but but that's not the way you want to live in the NFL, you know, week in and week out. You don't want to say, hey, you know, we better get 25 yards on third and eight or else. That's not really the way you want to live your life in the league. So you're trying to create proactively through the use of personnel, formation, normal down and distance situations where your film study gives you a much more defined and predictable idea of the defense, both in terms of fronts and coverages, uh, because you start to get into third and long. I mean, and that's when teams I'll give you a great example. Matt Eberflus, who's now the Bears head coach, was obviously in Indianapolis. 
um, and I've spoken to a lot of coaches who've told me this as well, but I noticed this on film, said that, hey, on first and second down, normal down and distance, their defense was very vanilla and not that hard to attack. Mm. You know, they relied more on execution rather than schematic approach. But they said on third down, Iberflus was great. He did so much stuff and he was very hard to play against. So you want to be in a position where you're you're attacking the known first and second downs in the normal down and distance situations, not third down where you're getting a lot of, you know what, and it's tougher to play. Yeah. No, just generally playing to your strengths. I remember asking Arthur Smith about that. I think coming into the 2020 season, cause they had the, I think throughout once, once Tannehill was inserted in the lineup, they had like the third most explosive plays. Yes. In that's my point. in 2019. They've been able and, to do that. Right. Yeah. And and even in 2020, but I remember asking Arthur about it prior to the season. He was like, some of that's just an anomaly. But as you said, they're just trying to be proactive on the front end and take advantage, which is something they and, certainly and, languished and at last year. You get caught up. And I say this honestly, and I guarantee the coaching staff has this conversation. I guarantee it that then you get into the conversation about it's first and 10 and we have Derrick Henry. So how, what's the balance between giving the ball to Derrick Henry and trying to create explosive plays on first down, which first and 10 is the best down to throw because you do get much more known fronts and predictable coverages. So it's the best down to throw, but then if that doesn't work, what do you hear from fans and others? Oh, well, you got Derrick Henry in the backfield. Why aren't you giving him the ball? And believe me, coaches, Coaches are not listening to the fans, but they're trying to figure out what is the balance there. What's the balance between giving the ball to Derrick Henry on first down, who had far and away the most first down rushes in the NFL a year ago before he got hurt in the Indy game, I believe he got hurt, correct? Uh, yes, yeah. week nine. Yeah, far and away the most first down rushes in the NFL, which you could argue is good and bad because you know, you're also trying to create some explosion in your offense and – the passing game is what creates that. And, and just talking to the coaches, it, it it felt, Greg, that they they felt at that point, given the personnel, that that was still their best option, rightly or wrongly. And I'm not you know, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm, of course, I'm saying it's a conversation they're having as yes, well. Yeah. Of you course. Know, and and look, there's only a right or wrong after you have access to the results. So that makes everybody you know a genius. But when you're going through the process of trying to figure out what your offense is going to look like as a general principle and then and then game planning each and every week these discussions are had how much do we hand the ball to Derrick Henry on first and 10 you know what's too much against this particular defense hey how do we want to create explosion plays you know these are every team that has a good back has these conversations I mean I guarantee the, the Colts will have this conversation as well Oh, it's it's the one I fully yeah. expect, and and you're you're one thousand percent correct. It's the one I fully expect they're having heading into this season because with five new starters on offense, they're going to be probably relying more on what they know is successful, which is the running and, game early in defense. And as a platitude in a statement, you can't say that's wrong, right? Because you know a healthy Derrick Henry is is the most dominant runner in the league. So what are you going to say? Let's not give him the ball. But then on the other hand, you know, you have to decide how are we going to score points? How are we going to score touchdowns? Right. Because yeah, it, it's it's lovely to give him the ball 10 times between, you know, between the 20s. But at some point, you've got to have somebody to get you a little further over the hump more than four, no, the, the, four the yards Titans, at a time. Not just because we're talking Titans and we're doing this, Buck, but they're going to be a fascinating offense to watch for that reason. Because obviously Derek, I'm sure, is healthy now, and he's a great, great player. That's not the point. But, you know, I'm just so curious, and particularly with an infusion of a new individual in Tim Kelly, who mm. comes from a different background, and, you know, how that all plays out. And, you know, they're they're trying to figure that out too, believe me. I, I know. I we we would love for Mike Vrabel to give us more detail on how they're trying to figure that uh, out. He won't but. do that, nor should he, to be honest. I mean, everybody wants to know. Inquiring minds want to know, but you know, there's no reason for him to tell anybody right now. Uh, other than for us to look forward to seeing how they're gonna come up with the challenge. It's Greg Cosell's analysis of the Titans third down passing game last year, and we'll see how they look to adapt and kind of evolve and strategize as things progress. But we're we're a long, long way from 
game planning quite just yet. We got to, yes. we're, we're just happy to see Traylon Burks out on the field for now. Greg. I, I figured. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So that's, that was probably a good sign, huh? Uh, it certainly, yeah. it certainly was. Listen, he looked a hell of a lot better. To, he, he finished a practice, which is all I can ask for. But that's right. That's right. I'll, I'll save that. Maybe steps one step at a time. Uh, you know, they keep, they've been telling me for six years now, Greg, doing training camps. One where, you know, one day to the next one day at a time, all these things, but it, that's it right. really is a thing. Greg, appreciate the time as always. Thank you, sir, for making us smarter. It's great to be back in the swing of things. I know it doesn't feel like we ever stop, but now that there's actual football in front of us, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun this season. I'm happy to have you for another year uh, doing the podcast, Greg. All right, Buck. Appreciate it. Thanks.